So again, welcome to the webinar today on carbon sequestration. A few housekeeping items before we get going. Uh, please, if you could put your phones on mute, that would be appreciated. But I probably will mute everyone when the presenter is speaking so that there are no audio interruptions. If you have any questions, I'm going to ask you to use this chat function right here and put your questions in there. I'll keep an eye on those for the presenter. And if we have enough time at the end, I'll open it up and unmute everyone to ask questions directly. So thanks for joining us today. I'd like to get right into the presentation by Andrew Carpenter from Northern Tills. Andrew is a certified soil scientist, certified crop advisor, and certified nutrient management planning specialist. For almost 30 years, Andrew has been recycling organic residuals and developing recycling programs for materials that have not historically been reused. He ex has extensive experience in research planning, hand handling technical issues related to the reuse of organic residuals. Andrew has a master's degree in plant, soil, and environmental science from the University of Maine. He founded Northern Till, an environmental consulting firm focusing on organic waste management and building soil health in 2003. And currently, he is serving as the treasurer of NEBRA, which we very much appreciate his time and talents. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Andrew Carpenter, and I will pass you the role now, Andrew. Great. Thank you. you Thank you very much, Janine. And as soon as you take as soon as you take that, I'm gonna mute everyone. Okay, so I'm not sure what Janine. Andrew, I apologize that did you, you mute muted me? you. Yes, I did. <laughs> That's okay. Let's try uh, starting you, again. Okay. Do you see um, what do you see on your screen? Yep, I see, you see your that whole intro screen. slide. Yep. Okay. Great. Um, I'm going to see if I can also pop up my notes while I'm looking at it. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I I want to tell you a little bit about what I want to go over today. Um, I do hope to have time for questions at the end. And if there's a way, I don't know, know exactly how the chat works uh, function, but if there's a way. Um, for you to ask questions while I'm talking. If you have something that's uh, focused on a specific slide, I'm, I'm willing to do that as well. Um, essentially, what I want to do is give you an introduction to the concepts related to carbon transformations in soil as they relate to organic matter-based waste, soil amendments, and, um, and carbon sequestration. It's, uh, it can be an incredibly complex issue uh, when you get into the finer points of it. I'm going to focus more on the concepts so that you have basic understanding of the concepts that go into it more than the actual numbers. Um, but ultimately, the goal here is to get you thinking about the factors that uh, go into play relative to sequestering carbon um, in soil and recycling organic waste. So um, the reason that this is important to us is um, soils actually play a big role in the overall carbon balance. And if you look at um, the amount of soils of carbon in, in some of these uh, different pools, you can see that the um, soil has somewhere between 1,500 and 2,500 petagrams, uh, which is uh, 10 to the fifth gra 15th grams, a huge amount of carbon in our soils. Um, and whether it's 1,500 or 2,500, it, I've seen different published numbers, but the the take-home message is there's as much in the soil as combined in above-ground biomass and the atmosphere. And there's a constant exchange between the atmosphere, the ocean, soils. It's always going back and forth. But it's if we have the ability um, to increase the amount uh, that's sequestered in the soil, we have the potentially have the ability to take some of um, that increased concentration in the atmosphere and, and take it out of the atmosphere and put it into the soil. 
Um, so in terms of organic matter transformations in soil, um, we have this you know, magical process that occurs of photosynthesis. We're actually um, capturing CO2 and oxygen from the atmosphere as well as solar energy um, and are able to convert those products into those feedstocks essentially um, into sugars that ultimately go into building biomass animals and 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 everything else so we're we're able to capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in the in the process of photosynthesis so as we build biomass we know it 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 only lasts a certain amount of time plants die uh, animals poop non living biomass ends up on the soil we have uh, certain microbial population in the soil that's very excited when they get some when they get access to some of this organic matter. I'm hearing an echo, and I'm thinking that it's possible that someone is not muted. That's correct, Andrew. That's their computer okay. reverberating back. Okay. Um, can you try, Andrew? If you go up to the little green three dot thing on your screen, maybe you can mute everybody else. Oh, let me see if I can do that. Because I passed the presenter roll to you before I muted. Yeah, which dot is it? It's the three dots all the way to the right. Oh, okay. Um, mute every All right, Andrew, that didn't work, so. It didn't, okay. Well, here we are. Um, so anyway, microbes in the in the soil are quite excited uh, when this organic matter, dead biomass, poop, all of these things um, hit the soil surface, and they are able to um, attack that organic matter um, and collect some of the energy, use some of the energy that's embedded in those organic carbon bonds to drive their own metabolism and build more biomass. Um, and in, a, in that process, they also, um, the, the, the end result is more stable uh, carbon in the soil that historically we've referred to as soil humus. And we think of that as the good stuff, the, the, the material that adds water holding capacity, erosion resistance, water stable aggregates, um, makes the soil dark in color, um, that stable long-term pool of soil carbon. Um, in this process, approximately two-thirds, and this is a really uh, important um, concept, approximately two-thirds of the carbon dioxide that was in that organic matter that the microbes have attacked and, and transformed goes, is evolved into CO2, goes back into the atmosphere. But as you can imagine, because we're capturing a third of it, two thirds of it are going back up, you've got a, a sort of an ongoing sink of carbon going from the atmosphere into the soil. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, because it's relevant now anytime you talk about um, soil humus, is there's a, uh, a raging debate in soil science, which we, we hardly ever get. Um, so it's very exciting. I mean, typically we're arguing about whether something is a redoxomorphic feature or a model. So now we've got, we've got this whole new soil carbon paradigm. It's very exciting. I, I've got to say, I don't know a whole lot about it, but the, the long and the short of it is that these compounds that we thought of as occurring in soil, humic acids, fulvic acids that made up hu soil humus, some people believe were just an artifact of the, of the lab methodology that was used to characterize um, soil organic matter. So instead of, um, the thought is that instead of microbes actually transforming um, soil organic, fresh soil organic matter into these more complex compounds, it's, it's just a matter of um, soil carbon that's accessible to the microbes to break down and that that isn't. Um, for, the, for our purposes, it doesn't make that big of a difference, but I think it's important to 
um, mention and nowadays when you talk about this, there are people that uh, feel strongly that that's the case and people that feel strongly that the old paradigm still works well. But instead of humus, then I'm going to refer to it as um, uh, stable soil carbon. So we've got uh, so soil in the um, We've got carbon in the soil. It's um, being captured naturally, and then over millennia, and, um, over geologic time, I should say, we've, we've captured um, carbon in the earth in the form of fossil fuels, and these are really long-term pools of, of carbon. It's below the soil surface itself. So um, with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, starting to use fossil fuels for um, energy, We've all of a sudden extracted all of this embedded carbon um, that was unaccessible um, and sequestered in the, in the earth um, and have used it as a form of energy. So we'll go through a, 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 a thermal oxidation process, taking all that carbon and ultimately uh, transforming it to CO2 and going into the atmosphere. So that at, you know, at one point before the Industrial Revolution, we had a little bit of an equilibrium, a relatively long, stable period of time where the concentrations in the atmosphere were about 280 parts per million. Um, so there was, it, it was always this transfer between the different pools uh, that I mentioned, but there was a relatively long period of time where it was stable, uh, relatively stable concentration. And now we've increased that concentration to over 400 parts per million by uh, taking this, the fossil fuels, um, oxidizing them, and evolving all this CO2 into the atmosphere. Another thing, um, and I'll tell you why I love this slide is because it looks like as this tractor is going through the soil, it's actually burning through the soil, the organic matter. And essentially, that can happen with tillage. When you when you till soil, when you plow it, and uh, the deeper you plow it, the more this happens, you're essentially providing conditions that allow for the microbes that are in the soil to to oxidize the organic matter that's there. So as we started tilling more and more land, um, that ox the, the carbon that was in, uh, sequestered in the soil, um, a lot of it evolves as CO2 and goes off into the atmosphere. And so this is exacerbated if, um, in addition to doing the plowing, you're not adding organic matter back to the soil, either in terms of our waste products, in terms of uh, crop res residuals or anything like that. So over time, with tillage and the use of um, getting your your plant nutrients from chemical fertilizer, there's a, a slow, um, steady degradation of the uh, soil organic matter globally, and a lot of that is going off into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. So while that's not really burning, that's probably just dust. It's great because it's sort of it represents it, it almost looks like it's it's going through there and burning through that organic matter. And you can think of it that way, it's oxidizing that organic matter, but not through thermal oxidation, microbial oxidation. Um and then this is exacerbated in situations like deforestation, where not only are you um are you losing some of that CO2 that's in the soil itself, but you're losing a lot of the above ground biomass that's been in place for a long period of time. Um, so, you know, the, the real simple look at this is we have organic waste materials that we generate. Um, we add them back to the soil and some of that carbon uh, from those waste materials ends up staying in the soil and building a, a a healthy soil ecosystem. And so the mo most sort of dramatic um, examples of that are reclamation project projects where you have completely barren land with no biomass, no below ground or above ground biomass, no roots, no trees, no grass. And then you bring in large quantities of organic um, byproducts and you add a lot of carbon to that soil. And not only are you sequestering some of that carbon, from the material that you've applied, but you're also building a soil ecosystem that has roots and, you, and, you're, and you're growing grass or you know, whatever it's growing in that spot. Um, but this happens in agricultural land application as well, um, with biosols, with manures, um, food waste, anything you're adding back to the soil. Um, so I'm going to, in, in um, 
a few slides refer to this greenhouse gas emissions model called the BEAM, the Biosolids Emissions Assessment Model. And this was developed by Silvis um, from Vancouver, BC in 2009 um, for the Canadian Council of the Ministry of the Environment. And it was specific to biosolids that can be used for uh, any kind of organic waste management. Um, and I worked on that with as a subcontractor to fill this along with uh, Dr. Sally Brown and then Ned uh, Beecher from Nebra as well. Uh, one of the things that we, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a good model. Um, I think it still stands up well. There are some things that can be updated. Um, one of the things we've found is um, in doing a more recent literature review, um, there's a lot more information out there on carbon sequestration from adding compost, biosolids, and other organic-based uh, matter-based soil amendments to soil. Um, the, we had a default factor in there for the amount of carbon dioxide equivalents that you sequester when you're adding, um, you know, a dry ton of, of uh, biosolids. And we've updated that. We found that the number, based on more recent literature, is higher than what we what we used in the past, and now it's sort of more in line um, with what we see in other models like the EPA, the EPA is warm model. So I said I'm not going to get into numbers, but in terms of this more recent literature review, what we found is about uh, 0.66 uh, metric tons of, um, you sequester approximately uh, 0.66 metric tons of CO2 equivalent for every dry metric ton of biosolids that you apply. So that includes the amount that you've sequestered and the below ground biomass in the roots and, and that so that, you know, there's some increased fertility. So you're going to get um, increased below ground biomass as well. Um, in terms of the impact of different uh, types of processing on organic waste, uh, I just want to go over again, uh, conceptually, what happens with carbon. Um, with land application, um, you're, if you're adding unprocessed, say undigested, uncomposted material, the oxidation that occurs, as the transformations that occur, the organic matter and the carbon uh, occur in the soil itself. And you're going to uh, essentially evolve a majority of the carbon that's in, embodied in the um, organic waste that you're applying is, is going to go off as CO2, but a significant percentage is going to stay in the soil. When you compost, uh, you can think of this as um, essentially doing that process, going through that microbial oxidation process before applying it to the soil. So in a compost pile, um, you're transforming a lot of that organic matter into CO2, which goes off in the atmosphere and water. It's, it's sort of the steam that you see coming off compost piles. Then when that goes to the soil, the carbon that's in there is more stable, less accessible to the microbe. Um, but in the end, if you look at um, what you've put into the feedstocks of the composting process to what ends up in the soil, it's not going to be that much different than what happens in the land application process. And then with anaerobic digestion, it's sort of somewhere in between. Instead of in, the, in the anaerobic digesters, instead of that organic carbon um, being transformed to CO2, you're using methanogens um, to convert a lot of that organic carbon to methane. Um, and so when you go, so, so a lot, the, the most readily available organic carbon to those methanogens is going to get transformed to methane and other uh, constituents of biogas. What you're left with in the digestate is something that's sort of somewhere in between um, land applying the, the unprocessed material and compost. So there's still some of that activity is going to occur in the soil, but some of it already happened in the digester. So again, it sort of evens out in the end um, in terms of uh, carbon sequestration of the initial mass of biosolids or whatever organic waste material it is. And then with incineration, thermal oxidation, and essentially you're, you're transforming all of that organic carbon into CO2. So unfortunately, it, um, like with, I guess, anything else, it's, in, it's impossible to make broad statements. It's, it's sort of impossible to say, I return this organic waste to soil, so I'm sequestering soil and I'm helping fight climate change. 
it would be nice if that were the case, but um, there are a lot of nuances. There are a lot of factors to consider uh, when it comes to managing organic waste. So this is a little bit of a tangent from carbon sequestration itself, but looking at the bigger picture of greenhouse gas emissions, you've got to take out into account some of these other um, factors, concepts. So one is anytime you're managing the material, you have fossil fuels that you're burning, that you've taken out of the earth, and is ultimately being evolved as CO2. Big thing, two big things. So probably the biggest is that you have the potential anytime you're managing organic waste to subject it to conditions, anaerobic conditions or anoxic conditions that generate methane, that turn that organic carbon into methane, and methane has a global warming potential about 28 times CO2. So for any little bit of carbon that goes to methane, you, you have a, a big impact on your overall balance. And then the same is true with nitrous oxide, only more so. It's very potent greenhouse gas. So there are conditions uh, with nitrogen-rich materials, adding them to soil, where you will um, transform some of the, the, the nitrogen um, in the organic matter, typically in the form of proteins to nitrous oxide that'll go up into the atmosphere. So if you look at um, just direct land application um, in terms of some of these um, potential debits, um, applying moist biosolids to fine textured soils, um, if they're incorporated or not, uh, well, even when they're top dressed, sometimes you can form nitrous oxide. Um, you know what I'm, oh, sorry, I went right over that. And, it, and also in terms of uh, stockpiling material prior to land application, you have the potential for both nitrous oxide and methane formation. Um, in composting, uh, you, have moist con you'll, you have moist conditions. Um, you have the potential for methane formation during the composting process, depending on how it's managed. If you then have no biofilter for that methane to go through and get captured in, you've got methane going off into the atmosphere. And then you also have moist conditions with low carbon to nitrogen materials often when you're composting biosolids. And again, you have the potential for nitrous oxide formation and that going off into the atmosphere. And again, it's like a 300 times the global warming potential of um, carbon dioxide. So a little bit goes a long way to kind of offsetting the good that you're doing by uh, recycling these materials. In landfills, um, which are often the alternative, they happen to be a very big source of methane uh, because you have um, wet conditions. The material is, um, so it's not going to be, it's not going to go through a uh, the same type of aerobic microbial oxidation process that occurs when you land apply it. Um, and unlike a um, a digester where you have a captured, you can capture all of the methane that's being generated. It's more of an open system. Um, so you have the potential for large amounts of methane to be evolved um, when you landfill um, organic waste. And also if it's nitrogen rich, you have the potential again for nitrous oxide emissions. Um, in terms of anaerobic digestion, you know, you have some benefits there in that um, you're converting um, some of that carbon to methane that you can then use um, to generate electricity and or heat, so essentially offset fossil fuel use, which is great. Another great thing about the process is the nutrients that you want for land application are conserved in the process. And in the end, like I say, in terms of carbon sequestration, it's probably about similar uh, when you look at the you know, what you're putting into the digester in, in terms of going to the digester and then land application versus directly to land application. Um, in terms of potential uh, other benefits, in addition to carbon sequestration and general soil health, um, there are avoided costs when you're using nutrient-rich um, materials, uh, soil, you know, organic matter-based soil amendments, as opposed to commercial fertilizer. So you're, essentially when you use um, manures, biosolids, things that have nitrogen and phosphorus in it, you're offsetting the need to produce more fertilizer. And so there's a, um, essentially a credit, a benefit to uh, overall greenhouse gas emission balance when you do that. Um, so I, I mentioned the beam 
I'm just going to show you a few different things because I, I, like I say, this is nuanced. If you, um, interestingly, when you look at uh, protocols that are out there for accounting for carbon and trying to um, get people carbon credits, they tend to be relatively simple. So they say if you're um, composting food waste that wasn't composted historically, that went to a landfill, now it's going to composting, we recognize that you're getting this much carbon credit because of methane avoidance, essentially. You're not generating the methane you did in the landfill. When, in fact, there are cases with um, composting where you can generate a fair amount of methane. Um, so even amongst different um, soil-based recycling options, there can be pretty big differences um, in the amount of greenhouse gases that you're generating. I realize I'm getting a little bit away from carbon sequestration here, but um, it's relevant because, like I say, this is sort of part of a bigger discussion of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then this is looking at recycling options, comparing them to landfill and, and then incineration. And just to show there, there can be some uh, the order, the scale on this one is quite a bit bigger than on the last slide. There can be some huge differences. Um, and you, can, you can't necessarily say that because I'm composting this material, uh, I'm doing a better job from a green, greenhouse gas emissions perspective than incineration. It might be in general that be the case, but it really depends on the composting process and the incinerator. And even now, we've gotten, we've gotten more sophisticated in accounting for methane generation in landfills. So we look at um, you know, how quickly it's capped, what kind of cover they're using. You know, in some cases, the, you can really reduce the amount of methane, uh, not get rid of it completely, but really reduce the amount that's coming from landfilling um, biosolids. And there is some carbon sequestration that occurs because some of that carbon stays in the landfill. I, I want to make it clear from my perspective, I don't think landfilling is a good idea for organic waste, but um, in fairness to sort of account the accounting process, um, all these things need to be taken into account. Um, there are also ways to manage soil itself without adding organic waste to soil to increase um, carbon sequestration, or when I say increase, really, I mean not decrease it so much, it, it, but in some cases actually decreasing it, so or increasing the carbon sequestration. Um, so uh, there has been a big movement in the country um, to go from deep tillage with plows and, and even minimal tillage with things like uh, chisel plows, uh, going from moldboard plows down to chisel plows and, and disc and and now um, a lot of farms are moving towards um, no-till planting, where they're not tilling the soil at all. They essentially um, create just a little slit in the soil to, to plant um, seed into. And this does make a really big difference in terms of carbon. So as I mentioned in the beginning, if you're tilling, and you're not adding organic matter back to soil, you're losing organic matter in agricultural soils over time. And even if you are adding organic matter back to the soil, but you're tilling, it's pretty hard to um, keep to maintain uh, organic carbon levels. But when you, when you move to something like no-till, you do have the opportunity um, to actually build organic matter. So one of the, the bigger farms that we work with in Maine, we, we did um, some calculations based on soil tests that they had from before they started doing no-till to afterwards. They, they started in 2008 and from, or I think it was about, maybe it's 2006. Anyway, in 14 years, um, they, based on the increase that we saw in soil organic matter, um, on 2,200 acres, they increased uh, soil carbon by the uh, carbon dioxide equivalent of about 34,000, 34 to 35,000 tons. So, it, you know, there is promise there. Um, unfortunately, like I say, things are nuanced. Everything's nuanced. Um, there is more of a reliance by farmers that use no-till on injection, liquid injection of manure. Um, so instead of adding soil to the uh, manure to the soil surface and then incorporating it, which is a fairly aerobic process. Injectors um, just um, have little slits also and put this uh, put this wet you know liquid manure in there. 
Um, and that has been shown um, to exacerbate the creation of, uh, of uh, nitrous oxide. So even though you're doing all these good things in terms of soil carbon, there's some potential negatives if, you, if you're using uh, injection with a um, nitrogen-rich material. And, and again, this isn't to say that that's a bad thing to do either. Um, it's just one of these, uh, another consideration. I personally like the idea of it because um, you save a lot of the ammonia, but um, it's, it's, it's something that needs to be taken into account. Um, pyrolysis sort of changes the carbon um, equation quite a bit. And as probably most of you know, there's been a lot of, um, I, I, I call it hype, about biochar um, for the past, uh, it's probably been 15 years now, and a lot of it is uh, sort of unfounded, ungrounded uh, hype, partly because there aren't really that many good pyrolysis technologies out there that don't um, use a lot of energy to pyrolyze biomass. But my understanding is that that's improving, that the energy balance on that end is improving, the technology is improving, so it could be in the case. It could be the case in the future that... Um, Pyrolysis of organic waste, including uh, biosolids and manures, might be uh, a, a good option for it. And one of the things from a carbon perspective that I think is really interesting is that during pyrolysis, when you're heating or combusting biomass under low oxygen conditions, and it's very specific conditions, you have the ability, uh, essentially this transformation of carbon occurs where it's carbonized or transformed to gra a graphite-like structure. And that material is very resistant to um, microbial degradation in soil. Essentially, it's a very stable form of carbon. So instead of losing two-thirds of your initial biomass to CO2 as it goes through the you know, microbial oxidation process, you can capture a much larger percentage in recalcitrant organic carbon um, that you add to the soil. So if you were able to do it, um, in an energy efficient manner, so you weren't um, kind of um, negating the benefits that you get from adding that soil by using a lot of fossil fuel or something else to, to go through the, you know, dry the material and go through the pyrolysis process, there is the potential to actually increase your ability to, to sequester carbon. Um, this is, this, so one of my clients, RMI, handles material that's uh, a very high carbon wood ash, and, and it, it's from a biomass plant, but because of the particulars of that biomass plant, how they run the boiler and their pollution um, control system, they actually get a, um, a carbonization process uh, in the boiler, and the, and the, the finished ash is, has biochar-like uh, qualities in, in, in a, um, including a very, being a very resistant form of carbon. So this is a, um, I did a um, soil incubation for them on the material, um, which we do on a, you know, limited basis, but from time to time with different organic materials. And we have an expectation um, of where we expect, you know, we add a certain amount of organic matter, we know we're going to lose a lot of it to carbon dioxide. We have an expectation of what it will be like after the equivalent growing degree day equivalent of a couple field seasons. And in this case, um, I won't go into great depth in this other to say that um, it was very resistant. We didn't, we added the material to soil and we didn't see much change over time. It, it was in fact very resistant to uh, microbial oxidation. Um, so if you go back to this um, slide I had talking about anaerobic digestion versus composting versus um, direct land application. Um, I, my sense is that in terms of um, going from that feedstock to what you ultimately have in the soil when you land apply it, whether you land apply it raw or unprocessed, land apply it as a, a digestate or land apply it compost wise, you're going to have a pretty similar amount of that carbon from the initial material stain in the soil. From what I can tell, with pyrolysis, you have the potential to increase that um, amount of carbon, the percent carbon from the initial feedstock, uh, to be sequestered significantly. That makes sense. Um, so that's it. I, I hope that there are questions, but just to summarize, um, 
soils do represent a large pool of, of, of carbon. And like I say, it's, there's a lot more embedded in the soil, sequestered in the soil than, than even the com combination of that, which is in the atmosphere and the above ground biomass. So if we add organic matter to soil um, and have good soil management practices, there is the potential to use uh, soil as a, as a sink um, and to try and mitigate uh, the high concentrations that we have in the atmosphere. Um, it's important to note that not all of the carbon embedded in organic matter-based soil amendments is sequestered, but that portion which is resistant to uh, microbial oxidation um, does stay in the soil. Um, it's, again, I, uh, unfortunately, it's not easy to make a, a broad statements like I, again, like I said before, I, I recycle my organic waste, so I'm doing, uh, I'm doing good as far as greenhouse gas emissions. It's, it's more nuanced than that. It depends on how you manage the material. Um, but anyway, you know, as a soil scientist and someone that's been working with organic waste for uh, quite a while, um, I still feel like um, with all the nuance and, you know, potential things that you could do wrong, um, it's absolutely, I think it's absolutely critical for us uh, on a planetary basis to be returning our organic waste to soil, both to sequester carbon and, and build soil health. And that's it. Well, that was a really informative presentation, uh, Andrew. Thank you very much. I think we can, I think everybody's unmuted. Let me see. We can certainly ask you to unmute your phones if you have any questions for Andrew. But there was one question or request in the chat box. Uh, with respect to, can you, would you be able to share references for the OM fraction debate that you discussed? Oh, yes. Yeah. Remind, uh, yeah. remind me what OM fraction means. I, well, this is so... Uh, that's a great question, and I do because someone just sent me a bunch in partly in preparation for this talk, which I did not go through. But um, I do have that. If you send me an email, I'll send it to you. There was a um, postdoc that's working for um, Dr. Greg Ivanilo in, um, I think it's Virginia Tech, and he's very involved in this in, in this debate and research related to it. Um, he sent me an entire, I guess it was links to an entire soil science society of america um kind of debate like a full uh day debate on on the on the topic okay so i will actually i can share your email with folks when i send out the recording and and please feel free to contact andrew directly i think we got yeah, some other yeah. questions um, hi andrew uh, at Mr. Shabazz Sufi, I'm from uh, Casella Waste. Um, I was actually um, I'm doing some graduate work and uh, was doing some research on um, biosolids and um, you know the carbon sequestration from like land application. And I, I wanted to get a clarification on like the impact of liming and carbon sequestration. Like how does it does it enhance the soil dynamics? I understand that of course from a life cycle perspective, you know the production of liming. Um, material, um, you know, probably has a lot of uh, carbon um, carbon emissions off of that. But how does liming um, impact like the soil dynamics with biosolids and, and land application? It, it really depends on um, the pH of the soil itself. So, it, you know, their their ideal pH is for um, microbial. Um, metabolism and for um, soil fertility. So essentially, and I don't know if this is answering your question and maybe because it, it, it might be too obvious, but anytime you use lime to get soil into that more ideal range, you're going to um, increase the ability of the soil to produce biomass. So it, towards that end, it, it could definitely be a benefit. There is, you know, in this, uh, in the beam models, um, we do have, we take we take lime into account not in that way, but um, we take the scope three, basically the upstream cost of it into account. And um, so there is some cost associated with it, but if you're using a, a waste material, 
um, as your lime source, then you, you're not necessarily uh, incurring those debits. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I was I'd used the Comet model um, for a project. I don't know if you're familiar with. I'm not. Comet. No. Um, and and it did show that there was a, a like a little bit of sequestration with the use of liming. Um, and uh, yes, you are adding a little carbon to the soil. Okay. All right. Great. And then someone just had a question about what? Oh no, that was it. What if your liming material is gypsum? Well, I don't. Um, it, it, gypsum is calcium sulfate, so it shouldn't have too much of an effect. And it, it's actually not. My understanding is it's not a liming agent. It's because you'll, you've got some sulfur in there and you've got some calcium that it. When adding it to the soil, it's a great source of both calcium and sulfate, but it's not necessarily going to provide you a liming effect. Uh, other questions for Andrew? We have his expertise for another 10 or 15 minutes here. So, Andrew, as the follow-up, when I share the recording, is um, the BEAM model that you spoke of, perhaps we could include a link to that for folks who are interested in? Is yeah, a... the C CCME, the Canadian Council of Ministers of the Environment, still has it uh, up. It's available on their website, and we could um, uh, I could find that link, and, and you could uh, give it to you so you could put it in the follow-up. All right, terrific. The, uh, your email. This is Jennifer here from New York City. Um, Andrew, do you have any comments on um, models of accounting you'd want to share with the group? Um, you mentioned that you know that often influences the way these numbers are looked at, um, and the model is a way to sort of quantify, if you will. But it's not necessarily an accounting. Um, so I don't know if there's any. Jennifer, can I stop you for a second? You're, you're, um, there's something in your, um, in your headset or something that's providing a lot of oh. static, so I couldn't quite hear what you were saying. You there, Jennifer? Can you hear me now? No. Yeah, no, that's much better. Okay, sorry. Um, I was just asking about um, accounting methods. And yep. you know, Beam's a model that kind of gives you a quantification, um, but then you would, I get, you know, put that into some sort of accounting scheme. Um, and I don't know if you have any comments around movements you're hearing from folks in industry or other organizations who are trying to figure out ways to look at this or maybe incentivize um, sequestration or building carbon in the soil as part of greenhouse overall greenhouse gas reduction policies? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question, and I don't have a great answer for it. I mean, there are um, ways to extract the information from uh, essentially, like you say, the quantification that you do in the BEAM into other accounting models uh, that are asking for simpler inputs, just, you know, costs associated with um, burning fossil fuel, nitrous oxide emissions, methane emissions. But I'm not that familiar with um, protocols out there for, um, you know, getting carbon credits or anything like that. My sense, and I've always felt this way about um, the BEAM, I think the BEAM is, um, is a very good model, but it's really, complex. It's got a lot of uh, different algorithms. And I made reference to this earlier in the talk. There, I think there still is. I know there was um, when the Chicago Climate Exchange was around, and, and it's possible that California Air Resources Board used this. There's a, something called a methane avoidance um, protocol specific to food waste going to composting, uh, taking it out of the landfill and going to composting. My 
sense of that is when you make a protocol like that, you have to make it simple um, because um, it's just it's got to be something everyone can use and just plug numbers into relatively easily. Um, so you 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 miss some of the nuances, and I and I feel like um, it, from my sort of outside perspective, because I've never you know traded in carbon credits or anything. Um, that that one in particular, you, you could send um, food waste to a composting facility that's doing a very poor job of managing the material and still get quite a bit of methane uh, going out of it. I don't. Uh, I'm, I'm not. I'm sort of strained from answering your question. I, I think the answer is I, um, I'm not as familiar with uh, the protocols out there for actual accounting. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe a follow-on question. I'd be interested if anyone else on the webinar wants to chime in. Is um, do you think that there's a place for those of us in the business of or in the production of organic materials to advocate for incentives? Do you think it, there's enough information that we could reliably, you know, run a program that, where people could try to put a number on something and make payments to people for sequestering carbon? Yeah, uh, yeah, I do. And I, I think we do have that information. Um, I do think it's possible. Um, I think I'd be one of the worst people to do it just because I'm um, prone <laughs> to seeing the gray in stuff instead of the black and white. Um, but I think um, I, I feel like the beam actually has a lot of the information in it in terms of references and um, that kind of thing to be to allow people to do a, a, an accounting that would help incentivize good practices versus ones that are causing more of a problem. Hey, Andrew. Um, yeah. This is Bill Brower. Um, so the, I'll put in a plug for the WEF. Um, the RBC, we have a subcommittee for greenhouse gas, essentially greenhouse gas accounting and inventorying and things. And Jennifer, there's one of the things we're aiming to do is to look at the research. A lot of it's coming out of California, looking at carbon sequestration and trying to replicate that around the country so that we can have uh, robust enough data where we can start to get carbon credits for carbon sequestration. Um, so if anybody's interested in that kind of thing or just greenhouse gas accounting in general or carbon sequestration from applying organics, um, it's the, the WEF uh, Residuals and Biosolids Committee subcommittee on greenhouse gas. It's kind of the, the clearinghouse for WEF in general um, for greenhouse gases. So if anybody's interested in that, you can contact me or just look it up on, online. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. very interested in that. Oh, sorry. Yes. Thanks for mentioning that, Bill. That's uh, that's good to know. I, I'm on the RBC, and I didn't know there was a subcommittee for greenhouse gases. Uh, well, that's too bad, but yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you know now. There's another question here, Andrew. Uh, what factors contribute to a good to good composting, and at the opposite should be avoided? You did touch on these oh. a little bit, but maybe if you could just review. Yeah, it's a good question, and we actually, as a as a company, just did a um, review for the Composting Council Council's Research and Education Foundation on uh, methodologies for um, for quantifying green uh, emissions from composting, and um, there the the you know it's sort of basic um, composting um, management. Um, decisions, I guess. So it, it, keeping piles well aerated is a huge part of it, but then capturing the air that's coming off of piles through in one form or another, either a cap um, of uh, mature compost over the top of the piles as they're composting makes a big difference. Um, if you have the ability to run um, negative air through a through a pile and then run that air through a biofilter, that makes a huge difference. Um, so, and, and even managing, um, managing the pile to make sure um, pH doesn't drop too much is just something I learned about recently in a, um, a workshop that I took at the uh, U.S. Composting Council. If, if you can avoid some of that, um, where you have some, um, kind of some of the worst, um, constituents, you know, potentially coming out of the piles, it can make a big difference. So um, from what 
I've seen in the literature, the um, biofilters are really effective at capturing methane, aerating the piles um, adequately is good at avoiding methane production in the first place. Um, managing your carbon to nitrogen ratio, I think, has an impact on nitrous oxide emissions, so really low C to N ratio blends are, are more prone um, to having nitrous oxide emissions than something that's more balanced up around, you know, 25 to 1 or something. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Andrew, for that answer. Any other questions from the group? Feel free. All right, Andrew, apparently not. Okay. But I will, I, I thank you so much for your presence. I actually learned a lot, thank you. I'm still oh, good. I, I, into this profession, so. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad. And, and um, I'll, you know, anybody that has follow up questions, I, I love talking about this stuff. My email address is andrew at northerntilth.com. Um, it's, um, Northern Tilt is one word. There are no capitals in there. Tilt is T-I-L-T-H. It's the physical properties of soil as they relate to plant growth. Um, dot com. And if you're naming a company, it's not a not a good idea to use a technical term that you have to explain to people. I've learned that over time. <laughs> I know you've learned a lot over time. And thanks for adding that pyrolysis <laughs> angle. Too, Andrew, because that's uh, definitely something we're hearing more and more about. Yep. Again, I appreciate your time sharing your, your expertise with all of us here in Nebra. Thank you all for attending our Lunch and Learn webinar, and check out our events calendar for some additional Lunch and Learn sessions coming up in July and August. All right. Thank you all for listening. Th thank you all so much for attending. Thanks, Andrew. Yep. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, thank you. Oh, good enough.